nilisoma Kiswahili katika chuo kikuu cha lugha za kigeni cha Osaka katika Japan. Eh? Hiyo. <laughs> Usome, usubone hivi. Unasoma Kiswahili? Yeah. Yes. Ah, good. Chuo kikuu cha Osaka baba. So the university in Osaka has a Swahili program. Yes, bachelor program. So we have many various programs in mm. Japan. Mm. So almost like 800 universities in Japan. So today we have very nice uh, universities guest. Actually they are Kenyans, mm. but they are stu- they studied some time in Japan and then they got the job there in Japanese university. Yeah, so please invite them. Yeah, they'll be joining us shortly and this is uh, Monica Nderito and Eugene Omalo from the Asia Pacific University in Japan. They'll be joining us shortly. As we do that, as we we'll wait for them to join the conversation, okay. tell us about the number of, again, number of universities that are there in Japan, especially those that offer English programs. Okay, actually, this time I would like to talk about undergraduate mm. programs. And then undergraduate program, it like total, like 150 courses from 50 universities. But among them, like we collected like 75 courses from 27 universities. They have a strong interest in Africa. Yes. And then they have mostly they, they teach in English. And sometimes you can... You can also learn Japanese and English. Yes. You know, when you say that there are a number of universities that now offer <laughs> courses that are taught in the English language, I want to backtrack a bit and say, okay, how many public universities do you have in Japan? Public universities? Government owned, not private. Okay. <laughs> estimate. Me just estimate. 300, 400, a million. You know, just <laughs> estimate. <laughs> a million. So est- estimate maybe 100 something. Okay. I, I Total number of universities? Is 800. 800. Now, of these universities, how many universities actually teach using a medium of instruction as the English language? How many of them offer courses in the English language? Right now, now like 150 courses from 50 universities oh, in really undergraduate level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And f- so far, what do you see the demand as? Do you see many people enrolling in these courses within Japan for courses in the English language? Or do people still enroll for, co- enroll for courses in universities that offer the courses in the Japanese language? Uh, okay. Right now, the rate, is f- the courses in Japanese language is much higher much higher, yes. higher than the late for mm. english courses mm. yeah but now they are trying to increase the number of those universities mm. which can offer english course mm. and then especially science course yes like engineering mm. agriculture yeah and also in yeah uh, also administrative mm-hmm. or economic courses mm-hmm. yeah there are many and then they are very famous popular ah. for okay. international okay. students now Well, let me explain why I'm asking the question. All right. You see, I'm actually asking three questions in one. Mm-hmm. One I'm asking is the learning of the English language popular in Japan? That's question number one. Okay. If it is popular, is the popularity increasing or is it decreasing? All right. Mm-hmm. That's number two. If I look at the courses that you're offering and the way you've opened up the society to other students coming from abroad, I think it's an excellent thing. Mm-hmm. It's an excellent thing for people to actually get to experience that culture, to actually live in a place, study in a place that's far off. Now, I worked in an institution mm-hmm. that uh, was helped to grow by JICA. Mm-hmm. Okay? And part of the course, part of the arrangement on the understanding, mm-hmm. many people were taken abroad to Japan to study for their master's and some for their PhDs. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, for purposes of cooperation, it is a good thing. What I'm saying, I'm asking a second question. Mm-hmm. What you are now working on, how different is it from what we've seen in the past? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the first question about uh, whether the English course is popular in Japan or not. Mm. And actually, the image is not popular so much. But <laughs> now there are many, uh, the, the government, Japanese government, mm-hmm. wants welcome many international students to come to Japan mm. and study. Mm. So they are trying to increase the number of the courses offered in English. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they are, 
they are now trying to advertise themselves mm. to all over the world. Mm. Yes. And, okay, and the second question, how different mm. from those JICA? The earlier, the yes, earlier the University of Nairobi, uh -huh. the, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, University of Agriculture. Okay. Uh, how different is what you're now doing from some of the initiatives that the mm -hmm. Japanese government had taken before? Okay. Uh, actually, what, uh, according to my understanding, yes. yeah, they, the, those, those sometimes back, they, they would like to, the they, okay, Japanese government think it's very important to develop Africa mm. through our skills, Japanese skills. But the now, we would like also welcome them to come and study after graduation they want they want them to be to stay there and work for japanese society yeah mm. so not only okay for it's it's good to get a degree from japan and then you can go back to your home country and then work for your society yeah that is also a very wonderful thing mm. but at the same time we also japanese government think that we would like to Welcome them into our society and then work with us. Yeah. Let's bring in the guests who are joining us now from uh, Japan. And this is Eugene Wanyama, who is admissions counselor at uh, Ritsume Kan Asia Pacific University, and Monica Nderita, who is also admissions counselor at the Office of International Admissions in the same, same university. Good morning, Monica and Eugene. Uh, good morning and thank you for having us again. Indeed, it's good to see you again, Eugene. Uh, we last spoke with you and you were telling us about your university and what happens. Let's welcome Monica into the conversation for the first time. Good to see you, Monica. We'll have an issue with her, with her audio. So let's start then with you as we sort out um, Monica's audio. Eugene. Tell us about Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. Where is it and what kind of programs do you offer? Uh, that's correct. Yes, you pronounced it correctly. It's Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. Um, but the name tends to be a little bit of a challenge. So most people just refer to it as APU, uh, APU Asia Pacific University. Um, and it's Yes, here's Monica. Uh, Monica, we can hear you, yes? Yeah? yeah, just go ahead, Eugene. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, so, uh, APU, APU is uh, located in the south of Japan, in a city known as Oita, um, in a town called Beppu. And it's actually quite an interesting place for a university to be placed because Traditionally, most universities would be in the bigger cities, universities which tend to uh, attract a large following of international students. But we're in a relatively small place. Um, and the courses that we offer, we, we don't have a very wide spectrum. Mm. Most of the courses that we offer can either be categorized as business courses or they can be categorized as uh, humanities. So for the business side, we've got, oh, sorry, for social science. So for the business side, we've got um, innovation and economics, we've got marketing, we've got strategic management and organization, and we've also got accounting and finance. And then for the social science, we've got environment and development, hospitality and tourism, international relations, uh, relations and peace studies, and we also do culture, society and media. Which of these are very popular among students coming from Africa, from these parts of the world, especially maybe Kenya, East Africa? Well, I would say from East Africa, a lot of students come for the business courses, mm -hmm. um, especially for the, for the master's course, uh, undergraduate as well. Um, because what happens, I think, um, you know, with such a vibrant society where majority of the people are young, actually, globally speaking, Africa is the youngest continent, mm -hmm. and East Africa is really vibrant in many different ways. Um, people are looking for opportunities to set up their own ventures. And our business courses, apart from, you know, giving students the tools that they need in order to get started, um, they also, we also allow for entrepreneurship. And people really like the idea of being able to grow their networks. You know, as they say, your networks are your net worth. So um, the business courses tend to be a lot more popular uh, for students coming in from Africa, from East Africa. Okay. And what, what are the requirements for admission into 
let's say, any of those business courses, or even let's even talk about the so social science courses in APU? Yep. Um, so for both of them, it's relatively the same. Now, one of the things that really surprises people is we don't really look into subject clusters because a lot of people say, uh, you know, I've studied chemistry, I've studied physics. Um, does that automatically disqualify me from pursuing, a, let's say, um, international relations course? And we don't really look at that. We look at your overall performance at school. We look at your overall grade. Mm. Because the idea here is that we're going to be throwing a lot of new concepts at you and we want to know how well you can learn, how well you can take to new information. Uh, we also take a look at the language proficiency. Mm. So uh, we require students to, pro to provide the TOEFL, TOEIC, or IELTS results if they are applying in English, which mm. uh, obviously from East Africa, students are applying in English. Uh, even though there are certain parts of the world where students tend to apply um, in Japanese. So um, for, let's see, I'm just going to refer to the documents here. For IELTS, it's about 6.0. Mm -hmm. TOEFL is 75 points. Uh, TOEIC is 750. Um, and this is just the basic requirement. So essentially, for, for, for somebody who's listening and has not, never taken this test, essentially, if you can, if you can sit through um, Kenyan style class, whether it be A44, uh, GC, GCE, IB, whatever. If you can sit through a Kenyan, uh, let's say, standard A class, mm -hmm. your level of English ought to be um, equivalent to what we need. Um, we conduct an interview. We also ask students to send in their essays and their write-ups of uh, who they are and what their motivations are. And we look at that to decide what exactly, um, you know, merits the students to be considered for the university. And especially, we, we, we really do pay close attention to your um, extracurriculars as well. The question I want to ask you, uh, first of all, thank you very much for accepting to come to the show again. Of the students who apply, yeah. what percentage actually get admission? Um, well, okay, so I cannot give an exact figure because it keeps changing and especially uh, in the past in the past two years or so with the pandemic, things have been a little bit uh, wobbly for us. Um, but I would say uh, roughly, uh, I would need to specify this one, but uh, I believe approximately um, I would say about uh, 45 percent, 45 to 50 percent currently, but I would that's um, from 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 the African region. But um, also, I would note that um, the number of applications have not been as many as the numbers that we see from from uh, this side of the world, from mm -hmm. Asia and uh, even uh, America at the moment. And one more thing that I'm going to add. Sorry, I'm just going to add a layer on top of that. For the APU application, a lot of students apply for the for admission into the university and they apply for a scholarship at the same time. So quite a number of students who get admitted um, really factor in whether they get the scholarship or not into mm. their final decision as mm. to whether they're going to enroll or not. The question, there is, let, let me explain why I asked the question. If you have people seeking admission, it means there's an interest. Now, in looking at the cases of specifically of those who did not make it, have you seen a common thread or trend as to what it is that uh, gets in the way of the admission? Because the interest is definitely there, but somewhere along the line, something doesn't quite work out. That is actually a very good question. Um, different people uh, get dropped for different reasons. Um, first of all, there's a... Uh, uh, okay, speaking as a Kenyan, yes. um, I went through the, the 844 education system, and one thing I can say, we were very tech-centric in our study. But what that leaves out is when you get close to Form 4, you don't really get um, thorough guidance on how to write, um, you know, uh, how to pitch yourself, uh, how to write an application. Uh, students don't necessarily get, um, some students don't get guidance on career paths. So there, we, we, every now and then we receive a number of um, applications where the student has not really thought through what they want to do. And you can see that they don't really understand the course that they're applying for. So for example, um, this is an extreme case and mm -hmm. I've only come across this once. 
Um, but uh, I remember those are students not from Kenya who applied, uh, who, who wanted to apply, and uh, they mentioned that they wanted to do hospitality because they wanted to work in a hospital. Oh. Which um, <laughs> to me was a little bit uh, of a shocker. Uh, it was a little bit uh, disappointing. So I think it's good if you can kind of, you can understand um, what exactly the course is about. Now, the other thing that um, I can say, especially when it comes to competition for scholarships, is the interview phase. Because, um, and this is a problem that we see with Japanese students as well. So one thing I can say about East African culture and uh, Japanese culture, one thing we have in common is that we tend to be a little bit polite about ourselves. So when somebody is asked, okay, go ahead, blow your trumpet, um, they don't really, they may not really know how to, what they need to bring forward. They may have done something amazing, but not really know how to bring it forward. Um, then, of course, there's the standard, there's, there are cases of people whose grades just don't really make the cut. Um, and, you know, it's, you know it's, it's always worth to try your luck. But there are certain cases where, uh, even though we're looking for a holistic, well-rounded student, um, there are certain cases where a student's application, in terms of the academic score, uh, it's just not university level. And a good bottom line to measure yourself with is whether you'd be eligible to enter um, a local university or not. Mm. So if your grade is way below what the local university would accept, uh, chances are you might not really be able to find a place here at AP. So you said one of the minimums is uh, the overall grade. So are you saying that in Kenya, entry level to university is C+. plus? It will be the same for APU and other Japanese universities? Yeah. Uh, I cannot say that as a definite because there are other factors that come into place. But I would say that, yes, we've had uh, a number of students who've gotten a C plus and they've been granted admission to the university, a good number of students. So that would be a good starting point. Um, and of course, anything that you have beyond that just amplifies your um, possibilities of being taken in. All right, let's take a break. We'll continue this conversation shortly. We're having a conversation with Eugene Wanyama. He's an admissions counselor at uh, Asia Pacific University. Also joining him on the line is Monica Derito, who's also an admissions counselor. And joining us in the studio is Dr. Midori Daimon, study in Africa, in, study in Japan coordinator for Africa, study in Japan global network project. We are discussing studying in Japan for undergraduate courses. There are very many universities that are in Japan that are offering uh, undergrad programs for Kenyans, you can apply, you could qualify, you go and study in Japan. And what is the sweetener here is that the Japanese government is also encouraging you, if you come study uh, in Japan, you can also work and live in Japan. So we'll be talking about that. What are the requirements for admission, especially to this Asia Pacific University? What else would you require for you to qualify for scholarships? And how do you apply? This is a conversation that we're having on Spice FM this morning. This is live on Spice FM online and on KTN Home. Back shortly. The Situation Room live on Spice FM online and on KTN Home. We are talking about studying in Japan this morning. With us in the studio is Dr. Midori Daimon, Study in Japan Coordinator for the Study in Japan Global Network Project. And joining us on the line is Monica Derito, Admissions Counselor at the uh, this university, Ritsumei Kan. Asia Pacific University and Eugene Wanyama, who's also admissions counselor. Now, let's talk to you now, Monica, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, the very good afternoon to you. We have been talking to Eugene and he's been telling us in you know, the minimum requirements and what happens, you know, when students in Kenya are applying for admission to universities in Japan and especially the APU. Now, let's talk about the scholarships. Somebody is asking online, do you offer 100% scholarships at APU? Well, thank you so much for having me. So, um, we do have scholarships and our scholarships range from 30, 50, 60, 80 to 100. So, if you're able to get the 100, then that actually means you're really good in terms of your academics. Then you have your ACES and you have your online interview. So if you made a very good impression with that as well, then you will be able to get the 100%. But not only that, it's, uh, it's basically the general view of it. At APU, we look at things holistically. So also with the time you also decide to apply, that could also be another factor as well. So um, it's competitive, but if, you're really, if you really put your best foot out there, then anybody can get their 100% scholarship. 
At the moment at APU, we actually have 24 African students with 100% scholarship. So that's, that's quite a big number. Okay. Uh, when you say 100% scholarship, my mind immediately goes to then what is a 50% scholarship and what is a 25% scholarship and what is a 5% scholarship? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so the 100% scholarship just means you do not have to pay any tuition fee. And uh, the good thing about AP is that your tuition fee lasts you for the rest of the four years. So four years, you're basically having zero shillings that you have to pay. The only thing that you have to um, cater for yourself will be your living expenses. So when we move to the 80, the 50, the 60, and the 30 percent, what we mean about that is that 50 percent of the school fees is already catered for. So you just have to pay the other small amount of it. So that's the only difference. Ah, I see. Now. I then have to ask the question. Somebody wants to study in Japan, but they don't have the tuition fees and they have to live there in order to study. So would you say that the cost of studying in Japan, if somebody was willing to a, pay just part of the requirements, pay all the requirements, how would that compare to studying in Kenya and paying for university education in Kenya? Well, you can compare the two. <laughs> Basically, what I can say about Studying, uh, studying in Japan is that um, the, the facilities are available. It's quite a different environment for the students, so you get a different experience as well. But in terms of uh, not being able to afford the scholarship, what I would say is that, for example, what Midori-san does is study in Japan. And between studying in Japan, you also have the next scholarship. So what happens with the next scholarship is that students, are, their fees are catered for as well as they're given a specific amount of money to cater for them as well. So if a student is able to get that, then pretty much you'd be studying in Japan for free and living in Japan. You're being paid to stay also in Japan. So that's a good thing. Um, you could also choose to study within your own country. That would also be something that other people might want to look at. But you, for me, I, I would say you cannot compare the two. Because if you look at it, especially for APU's perspective, you do get to study here, and then even after studying here, you get um, you get services, and we have like a career office. So you get the whole system in order for you to even get a job outside of outside of uh, graduation. And then plus that, we also have visa opportunities for you as well in different perspectives. Whether you want to have one as an entrepreneur, or you just want to have one as working. So um, you don't really need to tarmac as much as you would back in, back in Kenya. Especially after graduation, there are so many people who have graduated and you're not really sure about getting a job. So here at least we can say that we do have a 92% uh, job uh, application going through and, and students also get jobs as well, even before they graduate. Because we begin the job hunting between the third year, the last, the last uh, semester of the third year throughout the fourth year. You know, the mention of jobs and the availability of jobs is something very attractive to most Kenyans. Because one of the, the fears that many of our students at university have is, fine, university course, yes, graduate, definite. Then what do you do? Yep. Do you now go into construction work? Do you then hope that you can convince your parents or relatives to give you money to start uh, and a startup More here as a Kibanda mm -hmm. or sell things on the streets? What is it? So it's attractive. However... What capacity of students who study in these universities, either by going to Japan or studying for uni a course in Japan but in Kenya, what percentage so far have you seen actually end up getting employment? Just uh, roughly speaking, of course. Uh, here at APU, we have a 92% job rate. So with the other small number that's not there, basically those students either go back to their country mm. And the 92%, the, the basically, we, we have put it in uh, perspective. Some get employed, some actually choose to continue with further studies, whether they want to continue their master's at APU or within other universities in Japan or abroad. And the other ones actually start their own jobs here. Okay, so we have for a couple of uh, mm, students. Go, on, go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Oh, I'm sorry. We have, we have a couple of students from APU who have actually decided to start their own companies. 
So we have many restaurants that are started by students here. We have many companies mm -hmm. and in all services. So it just depends with what you study and what your future goals are. Actually, I, I, I didn't ask my question well. You had mentioned the 92%. I was thinking more of whether that training and that uh, exposure would put you in a much better footing in, on the job market in Kenya. Th th that's really what I was trying to ask. Oh, well, once you study in Japan, if you come back to Kenya, Kenya. you're more competitive. Yes, that is really what I was thinking of. Yes, it does make you more competitive because uh, you have studied, oh, well, I can just say in general, people have a view that if you do study abroad, you have a better experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, the experience itself would actually be in an, an environmental basis kind of a thing. So you've been out here, you've seen the world as it is, and maybe you'd like to go back and, what, and whatever knowledge and the things you've learned in Japan, you'd actually want to bring it within the corporation itself, the company you want to work with. Or if you want to start business, maybe you'd have saved enough to actually come back to Kenya and start a business and employ people. So basically, it's what you really want to do and what you've studied. And the good thing is there are actually companies in Japan that are actually wanting to venture into the Kenyan market. So if you're lucky enough to, to have one of that, then that would still make you very, very, it would give you an advantage, to be honest, <laughs> if you want to come back to Kenya as well. san I hope I've answered it correct. <laughs> no, of course, of course, Monica. Midori, as we're listening to Monica, she says many of the students, um, African students who have gone and studied at APU, they have ended up working in Japan at ninety four percent. That's very high. Would you say that that is a similar number across all the other universities that are admitting students from Africa, from East Africa? Okay, thank you for the inquiry. Uh, right now, I can't say that most or all universities has the same rate mm. as APU have. Yeah, and then especially the APU has many students from Africa. So the what they said is like the fact mm. from Africa, Africa for African students. Yeah, but now like Japanese government set some policies for the promotion of, of employment of international students two years before. Mm -hmm. So they, they, like, they set target of empro employment rate for international students was like as 50% against 36%. Yeah. And then also they set new visa status. Like if you can't get a job before graduation, but you can stay one more year, when you are uh, to by obtaining a special visa mm. with recommendation from your university you graduate from yeah so japanese government also trying to uh, encourage international students uh, to get the job after graduation in japan yeah so you're basically encouraging people to come and study and then mm -hmm. stay a bit longer so you get an extension of your visa with the recommendation of a university you can stay a year longer as you look for a good opportunity and then hopefully you get a good job, you stay on and work. Yes. Why is the Japanese government doing all these things? I mean, I know, yes, we all understand that the Japan is an aging uh, society. But does it mean that there are so many job opportunities available in Japan? Okay. Mm, yes, as, as you said, yes, we are, we are aging, aging societies. And then we actually, and then also we, we have... We, but and we still have yes many opportun job opportunities in Japan. But we also like like to get like skilled workers, professional ones mm -hmm. from international international students. Yeah, and then so I, I can say that they are good opportunities for international students, especially from undergraduate level. If you stay there like four years, you can also get manners, customs, and also language. And then that, that those skills and experience will help you to get a job in Japan easily. Yeah. They work to your advantage. Let's bring you back uh, into the conversation, Eugene Wanyama. Um, the number of students that you see applying, especially just particularly to APU, would you say that you're seeing a high number of high performers in Kenya applying to join APU 
and maybe through I'm, I'm sure you you have conversations with uh, other admissions counselors in other universities would you say that the high performers in kenya are applying to join that or is it people who are not in the a b bracket uh, well, we are getting quite a number of high performance coming in from Kenya. We have um, a couple of partner schools that we're working with very closely who send us uh, really good uh, students who end up performing well, they end up getting really good scholarships, and they end up getting good opportunities uh, both after graduation, both in Japan and outside Japan. Um, so if I can just uh, jump on the previous question just a little bit, there's yeah. something that I'd like to add on to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's kind of to uh, what you've asked. So the thing with Japan, it's not just the aging society, it's also looking for talent. Because um, if you look at the kind of relationship that we had in Kenya previously, we have a lot of situations where we have a top-down uh, kind of hierarchy where you go to a country because, uh, you know, the idea is that the country is better than you. But uh, the one thing with Japan is that Japan is looking for partners. It's looking for people who can who can give as much as they take. And uh, the kind of students that we've been getting from, 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 from East Africa have actually been doing some really, really outstanding things, uh, both here in Japan and back home. And um, that is what is giving more impetus to the government to create programs that encourage more people to come here, here to Japan. Because um, we've, we've, we've actually given the model case. We've shown the, the country that there's a lot of potential in the market in East Africa. And the government, you know, the government of Japan, always, one of the things that I like about the way it works, especially the Ministry of Education and other places, is that once they see an opportunity, they are ready to give an investment in terms of financial financial support, in terms of networking, and in terms of uh, connecting with other corporations. So anyway, going back to the question of art, yes, we do get quite a good number of high-performing students from East Africa. Let me ask this question, uh, both to you, Monica, and Eugene. What is the capacity of students that universities in Japan can take from people applying abroad? I mean, for instance, if we had 300 students who want masters, uh, who want to settle in Japan, uh, would you tell me, well, uh, Muga, 300 is little. Why don't you bring 200,000 more? Then I think we'll hit the threshold. So what's the threshold? So uh, we cannot let, let if we start off by speaking about our university, we have six thousand, uh, nearly six thousand students, uh, out of which we have about three thousand international students. That's at APU. Now, when you compare that to other universities, our percentage tends to be a little bit higher. Uh, but other universities are opening up to more opportunities. They're opening up more opportunities. And there are more and more universities which are um, starting fully, um, you know, courses fully aimed at international students. Uh, in terms of population and demographics, uh, we tend to get more students in Japan as a whole coming in from Asia simply because of proximity uh, and access to information and things like that. Uh, you've got people coming in from Asia, from Europe and the U.S. because of, um, you know, maybe financial issue, you know, financial uh, accessibility, especially if you compare Japan to the cost of uh, universities in the country. Um, but I feel like right now we have very few people in comparison coming in from Africa, um, simply because people don't really understand what educational opportunities are here in Japan. So in terms of capacity, we have significantly more spaces. Uh, in terms of even the scholarship programs, like the Abe Initiative Scholarship Program, uh, they always talk in terms of tens of thousands of students being brought in. Usually, it would start with maybe a couple of thousand students. So, uh, in terms of capacity for African students to find placement in Japanese universities, um, there's quite a lot of um, opportunity for students to come through. You said something that um, you had a model case and you proved that it works that there are very many students from east africa who've come to japan and they're doing great things in japan and also back home just give us an example so we can understand what you mean okay so uh for example so i mentioned the abe initiative program and this is a business program that's been set up by the japanese government it's called african business education abe and they offered a really good scholarship program for students coming in for a master's 
uh, degree. And APU accepted students coming in to do business. And we had, uh, so I'm, I'm going to take a student from uh, Somalia, for example. So this particular student came in to study business and he, um, he was one of the first Somalis to come to APU. And um, because, you know, I understand that, you know, you've got coverage all over the country, all over the East Africa, so I'm going to take uh, another country. But he came into APU, he spent uh, two years here doing his master's program. Within that time, uh, one of the best things that he got here was the fact that he could actually see practical experiences. He could um, go to Japanese corporations, both big and small. Um, he could see how they operate. He could. Um, he was able to um, talk to people whom he didn't have access to because the university has a really extensive network of advisory committee members. And now he's gone back to Somalia and he's working at a university called CIMAD. Um, he went back, I think, uh, about three years back. And so far, he's set up one of the first innovation hubs uh, within the region. Um, he's been working on creating uh, capacity for uh, women and underprivileged persons in society uh, through education. He's done collaborations with the university through the alumni network to support, um, you know, education, uh, IT-related classes for students. And he's also been uh, recognized by multiple, you know, by, by JICA, for example, Japan uh, International, uh, it's an international corporation body in Japan. Uh, who have then given him various platforms to come and make presentations here in Japan. And through those networks, he's been able to meet even more people who are ready to become sponsors and um, you know, supporters of his program. And we can only see great things in his future. So that's just one example of somebody who's gone back to East Africa and made mm. an impact based on the experiences and networks he found here. Good example, good example. Monica, as we conclude the conversation, somebody willing to come and study at uh, APU, What's the application process? What are the timelines? Um, what's the procedure? What do they require? So at the moment, we actually have the April, September application period. So it just depends on when you want to join, if you want to join in April or you want to join next year in, in September. But the application process is still the same. Um, all you have to do is you just have to put in your login details in our online application system. Then you can fill in your details. And we don't require a lot from you because everything is done online. So you wouldn't have to send us any papers or anything of the sort. So basically, all you have to do is upload your information, your documents. And then at the end of it, you'll pay an application fee, which is basically uh, 1,000 uh, Japanese yen. That should be five, is it? I don't know how many. <laughs> yeah, just 5,000 Japanese yen. And then um, after that, you'll have a, some test. It's a core ability test. And after the test, then if you're applying for a scholarship, then you will have an online interview. So it's done in stages, and between the stages is when you get your results. So you'll get your first results, that's telling you, oh, you've been, you've, you've seen your documents, and we'd like to have an interview with you. And then after the interview, you'll now get your final results, which tells you if, been, if you've been accepted or not, and if you were to get a scholarship, what percentage of the scholarship you've received. How long does that process take? Uh, the process depends on the application period that you apply. Like right now, we were about to start our September additional, uh, our April additional application period. So that application period basically takes like around 12 days. And then after your results are out, you only have around another 12 days to complete all the applications all the fees, if there are any that you'd have to incur. So basically, if there's anyone who wants to apply, I would, I would tell them to apply for the September because that's still an ongoing process. And it's until next year, March, for the September. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica Dorito, Admissions Counselor at uh, the Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. I have to, you know, Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. And Eugene, I have to pause before I read your second name because, you know, I'm conditioned to say Eugene and there's a second name that already comes in. It's Eugene Wanyama, Admissions Counselor. Asanteni Sana for joining us. And of course, Dr. Midori Diamond from Study in Japan. Asante Sana Midori, Kwaku Ungana Nasisi Hivileo. Okay, thank you very much. Asante Sana. Wale ambao waja kusikia ukizungumza kiswahili wa wazungumzia kwa kiswahili wa ili wa ilijue kwamba unaelewa. 
Wambie kwa heri. Kwa heri ni sana. Asante. Sikunjema.